Yeah, here we are. It says we're live on Facebook. Okay. Hello, Paul Costello. Hello, Sven Eric. Long time no see. That's a long time ago since we were in Washington, D.C. together, well, trying to figure out what storytelling was all about. Yeah, wow. Yeah, and you, I have, you don't, look, you you don't look any older. You don't look any older, Sven. No, no, no. It's like time is just. Well, in what fact, happened to that? You got, in fact, you got more hair. I think you got more hair than me. Hey, it's true. Instead of yeah, <laughs> <laughs> I'm working on it. But I've invited you to one of these stewards because, um, yeah. Well, uh, we are. We have been doing this stewards now for. <coughs> Since all oh, this lockdown in the in the spring, mm -hmm. and what happens is that uh, I invite storytellers from around the world to share, to talk, to be inspired by each other, and the first thing that happens is actually me muting myself because it's of course you as a guest who will talk, tell share some ideas some thoughts so you have the first part for yourself and the whole thing is then i hope that i don't fall asleep while you're talking <laughs> and i hope that i get inspired to say a few to say something after your your what you have done it's like a conversation mm -hmm. so when i tell my stories you'd be inspired to do something and then i so we go on for about 35 40 minutes Mm -hmm. And then we say, thank you so much. Have a good day in that well evening. No, it's a day, right? It's mm -hmm. 10 o'clock now in the morning yeah. in Washington, D.C. And you can say, have a good day. I'm not in Edinburgh at the moment, but in Aarhus. So if that's clear for you, I just mute myself, Paul. Mm -hmm. And then it's up to you to tell me a story or a thought, whatever you want. Okay. Okay, well, um, so let maybe let me, let me just share a story that I've been sharing with uh, a, quite a few of my friends uh, who've been gathering a little bit like this to deal with um, the, our crisis. Our, our, I am I run a volunteer program here in the states called Ameri a little program of AmeriCorps, which is like the Peace Corps, and I I have a program of about. 15, 16 uh, people who are volunteers full time and they work with the neediest kids in the school system. So the office of this program, of my little program, is in a school. And this school has normally got 675 kids um, aged between, you know, um, 10 and 14. And so you can imagine like at, at, at lunch breaks and at um, it's a pretty noisy place. It's a pretty happy place. There's kids playing outside. Um, there's kids running down through corridors. There's teachers yelling and saying, don't run, don't run. And, and all that kind of good stuff that goes on in a, in a middle school. And what's striking me every time I come to work uh, for the last six months is the deadly silence of the school. Just, um, there's no, there's no sounds of kids. Um, and it's as if I don't know. Is it is it the is it the ancient is it a sort of the myth of Pied P the Pied Piper of Hamelin who leads all the children away? You know, all the kids are gone. Well, of course we know they're not gone, but like it's just haunting to me. So I drive in to the car park every morning, um, expecting the kids and parents dropping kids off and the bustle and hustle and so on, and it's just. It's, it's a deadly silence. And then when you throw, that, throw into that what's happening around us, the, the colors of autumn, the four colors, the, the leaves, the leaves falling from the trees and the reds and the purples and the golds and the browns. And so the tree's starting to look a little bit bearer. And it's kind of like a, I don't know, I, I, want, I want to get my, if I could play violin, I want to get my violin out and play winter from Vivaldi's Four Seasons or autumn, you know? Something, if a Martian was coming here, he'd, he'd and it's, it's November already, 
and we're two months into a school year, a Martian window, something is, something's wrong. What happened? Like, like what happened? Something's wrong. But, but the fact that the playgrounds, I don't know, is it a Cat Stevens song which says, you know, where do the children play? I know there's some songs or maybe I'm thinking of some great story at the back of my mind. And I think of the, the Pied Piper, but what's happened to all our kids? And, um, and where's the sound of children playing? What happened to that? And, uh, you know, what, uh, what does that, what, what does a culture lose and what does a community lose when it can't hear the sound of, the innocent sound of children playing in a playground? Um, so that, that's my work. My work is to work with volunteers and we've, we've had to do lots of innovative things around working with kids virtually and helping teachers teach virtually and so on. But I don't necessarily have to go into that. But one of the questions that in the groups that I work with, and uh, you mentioned, Sven, you mentioned tour guides. I, I do some, I continue to do work with tour guides in, in, in DC because their whole industry has died. I mean, there's no tourists in Washington and therefore there's no tour guides. It's like, it's a multi million, it's 20 million visitors to Washington every year. Well, gone, no, no hotels, no fl plane flights, no tour guiding. It's just disaster. So I've been doing some work to support that community that I care a lot about. And the question that I'd pose, and I pose maybe to the people, to you, Sven, and to people listening, you know, we're now in November, this started in March. That's uh, like, that's six months or more. What's got you through? Tell me what's got you through. What's sustained you so far? And I, so I've used that question as a prompt for an adult community that I'm a chaplain to. I used it on Sunday for my, uh, for the, the DC tour guide community. Uh, I've used it for lots of different groups, even amongst my story to what's got you through. Cause I just think that's really an important question. And then when they ask me, this is the story that I, I tell them, which may be, you know, may touch some people since there's people listening in Europe for this. Um, my mum and dad, I'm a product of World War II, meaning that mum and dad met in World War II. Dad's Australian, mum is Welsh. They both were in the Royal Air Force. Dad joined the Australian Army and then uh, when they were, and then joined the Air Force in Australia. And then when they were, Bomber Command were losing so many crews over Europe in the early part of World War II, they sent out a, 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 a SOS to Afri South Africa and New Zealand and India and Australia. We need, we need crew. We need crew for, 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 for our bomber command. And so dad got recruited to England and trained as a navigator. And that's where he met mum. Mum was an Air Force nurse. So um, dad flew 30 missions in, uh, over Europe, uh, you know, against the Nazis in a squadron that the, was, lost the most casualties of any squadron in the whole World War. So like if you, if you did 10 or 15 missions, your number was up and that was it. You were dead. So they were churning through crews. And of course, there's mum in a hospital, Air Force hospital nearby, and she's patching up the crews. The crews that come back injured from, the, from, their, from their missions, you know, mum is in the hospital <laughs> patching up the crews of the Air Force, uh, of, the, of, the, of the Air Force squadrons. But dad was a navigator, which meant that one of the key instruments he had was a watch. So dad did 30 missions, uh, almost got shot down lots and lots of times, saw lots of people killed, but his watch. So he was the navigator and timing was everything. So when dad died a few years ago in his 90s, um, that watch, you know, the watch that he had. Um, I, I love, you know, I, I, I love that story of navigation and stuff. It's part of my work now. But um, the watch was left to me. Dad gave me the watch before he died. And, uh, and, it's, and it still goes. I mean, he got it in 1944. If you put it on eBay, I'll probably get a few thousand bucks for it because it's a top line watch. It's absolutely classically designed. It's a wind up watch, you know, but it still keeps absolute time. And as a navigator, a few split seconds could be the difference between life and death over a, a target that's trying to kill you. So when the, when the, when the, when the pandemic broke and everyone was on shutdown, I decided I needed something to sustain me. I needed something close to me. So thinking of dad's story and thinking that that watch got through 30 missions 
uh, the dad survived 30 missions over enemy Germany and, and, and Europe and France, and the Nazified Europe, um, that I'd put that watch on uh, and keep it on for the duration of the COVID to get me through and for dad to be like my pilot or my navigator um, through this tough time and sort of reaching back to the resilience and the courage of my family's story and encouraging people, other people to do the same. Like what, that, that there is a story in everybody's history, I think, family's history, grandparents, great-grandparents. Um, something got them through that allows you to be alive today. And like, like, so not to take it for granted that you're alive today just because you deserve to be. Um, something got them through. And if we can touch into that, maybe it'll get us, it'll get us through. So, um, so that's my little story that I, that I, that I'd offer people, you know, the, the, the watch. So, um, I don't know how we're going for time, but maybe the third. So the first thing I, I you know, I just saying the silence of the playground is striking me and haunting me a little bit. Secondly, what, what, to encourage people to try that with your family, with your friends, with your community, you know, to sit in a circle and just to share what, what, what got you through and then build on that to say, all right, we're not out of the woods yet. I mean, the incidents, I'm sure it's happening. It's happening in, in Ireland and in England and in France. It's happening here. It's spiking again. COVID is spiking again and the, the, the casualty rates are going up. Um, in fact, this morning, uh, somebody that I knew through my Israel-Palestine work, Sayyab Arakat, who was the chief Palestinian negotiator, uh, I know he's been sick for some time. He died of COVID this morning in uh, in Ramallah. And he's somebody that I had dealings with in the, in the peace programs that I was running. So it's like, wow, this is a killer. This is just the toll of this is. So the question of what gets you through, what's going to, what's resilience for you? Um, so there, that, that's my story. I could go on and on and on, but I don't know whether um, you want me to keep going on and on and on, or that's more than enough, or you want some reactions, Finn? Thank you, Paul. Well, um, I think you, you, you have the possibility in a moment to, to, to go on and on and on and on. But uh, the duets, the it's always like, um, yeah, you share a story, I share a story as well. So if you ask me what... Uh, yeah, what gets you through? What gets me through? Some of it is these duets. Um, it was a like it's quite spontaneous idea when everybody was like on a computer instead of telling stories. We uh, did um, in our apartment, my wife and me, we invited people into something we call soup and stories. And that was like soup. Yeah. And stories. Wow. But of course, music as well, song as well. And, and, the, and the kitchen was filled with people. But when we couldn't do that, we started thinking about, I thought, well, this duet's idea was like coming out of a something that we did in Copenhagen many, many years ago. It's this, when you say something in a conversation, then it inspired me to say something. It's strange in a conversation if I started talking to you about something that had nothing to do with what you just said. Mm -hmm. So that sort of the storytelling in a relationship with conversation. So we just tell the story that inspired from what you said, it inspired me to do this story. And these duets have been really important for me that you can find them online. There's lots of them and it's from Denmark and Norway. And it's just wonderful to have this opportunity to be together with another storyteller. And mm. what actually inspires you in the world? And it sort of takes, we have taken many routes and it, it's definitely one of the things that got me through. And another thing is my dad. My dad, the blue collar guy, was like a hero in my life, working class hero. He's kind of the guy that gave me a hammer and a nail and said, hey, try to figure out what to do with this and i was like what do you mean by that and it's like and i love books and he was like what is that but during this pandemic i've 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 had a lot of quotes from him a lot of times we were in a situation suddenly i heard my 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 daddy's voice 
just very clearly because his way of looking at the world is very was very very clearly everything was about something that you could have in your hands it was always about something that was tangible it was not abstract the world wasn't abstract at all it was really here there's a table there's there's a man there's there's whatever it is but it's always something that you can you can feel with your hands but your story about the second world war inspired me to i don't know if i'm it's 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 a very very hard story it's about my uh my I, I I was divorced in 2016, but my um, wife's former wife's uh, father told me a lot of stories, wrote a lot of stories to me, and one of them was that he came to Germany in '51, and in '51 it was like normal times again. But he was actually there to take care of the German soldiers who was coming back. Was not you know making another war right i mean they were all um supporting hitler when they when they left germany and we, we the the people of denmark soldiers from denmark were taken care of that they not going to do something bad when they came home and as it was christmas one christmas eve he walked around with a with, he had got himself some chocolate and there was a german soldier sitting on a bed crying he he was very sad and the only thing my my father-in-law could do for my father father-in-law could do was to give him a chocolate and he said then can i can i tell you my story and my father-in-law said yes it's all right and he had just came back from siberia as many of the German soldiers did, and found that his wife had got himself another husband because there was no reserve message coming that he was actually taken prison. So his uh, wife had found his best friend, actually, and this best friend had committed suicide because he didn't want to stand in the way of the soldier, but his wife was kind of strange for him. It's, the whole thing was really difficult, but he said it's not the worst thing about this. Every time it's Christmas, I re it reminds me of when I was in Stalingrad in uh, 42, Christmas 42, when we were lying there and there was this, this, this soldiers on the other side, the, soldiers, the Soviet soldiers, and we were in a, in a big hole in the ground and they had a machine gun. And then there was a horse. A horse came and it was like, why a horse? You could hear the horse. And then suddenly you heard the machine gun from the Soviets just shooting and, and hitting the horse who fell into another hole. And he was lying there screaming. And I couldn't stand it, the soldier. So I just have to run up and kill this horse. And he ran up and killed the horse in the hole. And as he was doing that, they started shooting. So he couldn't go back to his hole. So he said, I stay here with the horse. That's all right, the, the other guy said. So he sort of made himself as comfortable as he could and took some warmth from the dead horse as well. So in the morning, he woke up with a, a mother and two children standing there looking at the horse, dead horse in the hole. And then he said, I did the worst thing I ever done in my life. Because he got up, he raised himself from the horse. And in that moment, the, uh, the, the Russian the Soviet woman was really scared of this soldier who came from the back of the horse. So she jumped back. And in that moment, the machine gun just... And that's the most frightened and worst picture in my life, he said, because this woman was cut into two and, and the two children were trying to get her together. Mm. And, and the soldier just looked at him, took a piece of his chocolate and said, I'm so happy that you, that you, that you had the time because normally when I start my story, everybody just shouts and, and run away. 
but you actually heard my story. So I heard that story from my father-in-law and he was he was very keen on on just telling that because he was listening it made it possible for the German soldier to survive that Christmas. Wow. Wow. That's pretty powerful. That's pretty powerful. Yeah, I mean I think um I mean, I, 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 as as the president elect here is talking about, we're, we're getting ready for a dark and a, a dark a dark winter. Although you know, there's news today of a vaccine. I guess you know, what does Anne, what does Anne Fra is it Anne Frank who, who wrote in a diary? You know, you know, in even in the darkest places of our hearts, there is an internal sunshine just waiting to waiting to arise and show itself. So, I mean, I think. Um, you know, the distillation of hope in a hard time. I mean, we, we, I guess we, as storytellers, to be conscious of what kinds of stories we're telling and what kinds of effects they're having. Um, the other thing I, I, I was going to say is I think, um, you know, without getting into the politics of it, but I, I think the last couple of years here in, the, in, in, in America, in the political scheme, stories have taken over i mean we we put the powers that be in politics have decided that stories are more powerful than reality and reality doesn't matter anymore and you know you could win an election but it looks like maybe win an election by four million five million but the story is that somebody else won the election so it's like reality is this and story is this and if this, people might be smarter than us maybe we've been maybe as storytellers in the world we've been outsmarted by people who can see the, who've realized the power of story more than we have and we're supposed to be professionals at it and they've realized that you can the story can make facts irrelevant and if you learn to tell a story so powerful that it's resistant to any factual contradiction then you've got people creating reality out of their beliefs what they believe not what they know but what they believe um and th and you know that's pretty it's, it's powerful stuff that we know when we when we're working with organizations and communities and we are always think we're the good guys you know we always think we're the good guys we're virtuous and we're trying to make a better world but uh, you know probably i wonder whether sometimes we're a touch naive and realize that there are other people who actually also are just as excited as we are about the power of stories, but that in fact, they realize that they can spin a story so powerfully, so persuasively, that it can replace reality for some people. And it, or it becomes what they want, it, they want reality to be. And you can feed them fantasy and you can feed them science fiction and you can feed them prejudice and you can feed them, feed them hatred and you can feed them fear and it absolutely creates a different reality and a different perception of reality so i i mean one of the practices that i, I again i when i'm teaching and when i'm talking to me it's like i think storytellers like us have got to take our conversation about stories into the territory of power we don't often do that but stories are a manifestation of power and the two have to be in the same conversation who's telling the stories so for time and time again, we've seen, you know, there's a panel here years ago of men and the issue was about women's reproductive rights and the panel after panel, it was men on the Senate committee listening to men on the witness stand until somebody got the bright idea. Wouldn't it be interesting to have a woman? So quickly, lastly, they got a professor from Georgetown University to be on the last panel. And this is like power and story, like, Men have told the story of women. Whites have told the story of blacks. Straights have told the stories of gays. You know, don't, the powerful have told the stories of the powerless. It's like stories are about power. The story of power is the power of stories. And so I, I don't know, I think, I think our work has got to be a bit edgier if it's not already edgy around, um, you know, because I think sometimes we're just, uh, we're, we're, as I say, we're not the only people who realize stories are powerful. And, um, and sometimes, sometimes, you know, living in Washington for the last four years, it's almost as if I'd want in my arsenal, my tool kit, I, 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 want, a, I want a tool kit of anti-stories. I want a tool kit to, 
to fight against stories, to, to disintegrate stories, to disarm stories and say, that's just a story. You know, Mexican immigrants who come to America illegally are all rapists. If, if people believe that story, so my job is, and people say you, you counter a story with a story. I don't believe that anymore. I don't think it's a question of story versus story. I think you've got to change the norms. You're not just going to change the story. You're going to have to change the rules and change the norm. You've got to change, um, you've got to go one level above it to change what's the phenomenon at the, uh, at, at the, me at the meta level. You've got, like, I think you've got, to, you've got to change the culture that, that accepts these kinds of stories, or you've got to change the audience to these stories. So, um, so that's a little cautionary note as we enter into, you know, the end of the year, elections, vaccines, COVID-19, Brexit, <laughs> um, you know, like, boy, and we as storytellers, boy, we, I think we, we have a lot of tools that I wish we would work together on and just say, listen, we've got to demystify some of the stuff that's coming at us that's more powerful than reality is. And that's scary. We met in 2001, I think, something like that. You, uh, you had a, a tour around in Washington, D.C. I never forget that, I think. I never forget it. I mean, uh, I don't know what's happened with my brain, but I still remember it very clearly when you were walking around in Washington, D.C. And one of the things that I was really sort of taken by was your love, your passion for what you were talking about. Um, and and if you bring that in, this 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 that you that you really go for what what you what what's close to your heart, then then the light would always be there with you. But I haven't. Um, I've been away from what you're talking about because I also in 2001 went to a. Um, to a workshop and and at one point one of the storyteller Danish storyteller said very loudly out to 700 people it doesn't matter if a story is true or false as long as it just works and i went i, I remember i went like this what are you talking about i mean you need to to find out whether or not the story is true before you as a storyteller tell that story as a true story you can't just just ignore that fact. But what I say is that I have been here in Europe make, taking care of the Brexit and everything. <laughs> it's like that is a very strange thing for us here in Europe. But I've been looking at what you have been doing there for now four years and it's still continuing. And it really is quite shocking that stories sort of just moves on it's like what you said was that you 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 have this counter story this dave snowden i think that said in an organization if you stop that you can't stop a story with facts you need to take it in the hand and transform it but that transformation also creates something that you don't really control it's like then suddenly you're just way out of line from everything that's maybe a track of truth maybe a track of hearts but it's it's it is an obligation and i feel it very strongly when you talk talk now so so clearly about is that we need to find a way for storytellers to bring in um something that dignifies the sort of taking humanity again right i mean because you, you, We've had the fact checkers here at work, um, you know, and they're putting out books and, you know, in a different era, if, if, if a leader told a lie um, and it was discovered that the lie was deliberate and that the lie had real consequences, you know, that, that, that I lied to somebody and said it was safe and something wasn't safe. And because they believed me, they put themselves in harm's way, or even they died. That would have been uh, that would have been seen and judged as like um, that leader doesn't deserve to be leader anymore. Hmm. But right now, something shifted, 
and, and I, and I, you know, you could be, something shifts around an emphasis so that, you know, no, there's always a kind of, um, you and I don't necessarily have the wherewithal to, to, to validate all the facts and all the, all the issues. So how do we equip people to, to smell a story when there's a, when there's, you know, con, mm. the con is on or when somebody, mm. you know, like to make people not cynical, but skeptical again, mm. to, 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 to reinvigorate a notion of skepticism. Because I think underneath it all is if, if Sven, if I told you a story, uh, that you know such and such and such and such what i'm if, if it's such if it's so far-fetched and so maligning of some op a, a group of people i'm insulting you i'm insulting your intelligence i actually think you're going to swallow this horse shit i actually believe that you're so stupid so i think when the politicians here and i think in the in the uk that i know a little of when they get up and and and, and feed this stuff to the masses I take that as an insult. They think we're stupid. They think that the masses are going to absorb a lot of this uncritical kind of myth, myth and prejudice that's been spun to us. But how do we create a set of narrative critical skills or narrative literacy for just you and me and everybody or to teach it in schools such that I don't need to know the facts of a story. I can immediately smell you know, who was it says, you know, always be suspicious of a breathless car salesman. <laughs> you know, like if I'm the head of the Pentagon and the military and I say, um, Mr. President, President Sven, we need more money for our armies. We are, the Russians are going to do us in. We absolutely need more money. Now, if we believe that, like crazy, like He's the head of the Pentagon and it's in his own self-interest to have more money, to have more guns and more soldiers. So like there's an agenda that's like people come out sincerely, but it's the, they're, they're pursuing their own agenda. And sometimes I think we've just got to be sort of like, whose interest does this serve? Does this story serve? The, that's the power question or the narrative ethical question, which is always this question, which is like, who was the most likely to be affected by this story? And is their voice legitimately in the story representing what they need? Who is, so let me ask that again. Here's, Cause this is a little touchstone for people to use. You know, um, I'm going to tell you that most, all the Mexican immigrants who are illegal in America who came in are all rapists and they're all terrorists. Okay. I'm going to tell you that. So the narrative ethical uh, uh, critical review of that is, who are the most, who, which people are most likely to be affected by that story? So recent Mexican immigrants and Latina immigrants, right? And is, is their voice legitimately in the story to represent their perception or their need? No. All right. Well, then, you know, that's, that's narratively unethical. It's not, a, it's, it's not, I'm not saying it's a lie because I'm not even going to go into that realm of true false because I don't think it works anymore necessarily. And I don't have the wherewithal to validate the facts. But someone is telling a story about Mexican immigrants who's not a Mexican immigrant, but has an agenda and is a politician and knows that someone's going to be affected by the story that comes out in a tweet or whatever. But there is no legitimate voice of those people represented in the story. Therefore, I immediately know it's bogus. It's totally bogus. So... That way, it's like, I think, uh, to me, the, the, the new work for us, and even if there's a change in administration in this nation, the nation is still sort of split down the middle. We've got a lot of work to do, a lot of work to do. But I think it's, it's not just teaching people the performance piece about how to tell a better story. I, I, I worry about that sometimes because, you know, people are getting better and better telling lies. Mm -hmm. the stories are getting better and better and better. I don't know whether people need to be taught to tell better stories. I think people need to be taught and we need to research and teach how to disarm those stories that are harmful, that are just demeaning, but, or that they sow uncertainty. They sow doubt. You don't, you know, that you take uncertainty as, as a sign of mischief rather than uncertainty just being a fact of life. 
the fact that we don't exactly know who won Georgia in the voting yet is not a sign of mischief. It's, it's just the votes aren't counted totally yet. But if I can sow suspicion, oh, there must be something going on here. So we have that room of uncertainty to sow seeds of doubt. I mean, Hannah Arendt wrote her wonderful book about the, the, the origins of totalitarianism. And she spots it. She says, that's, that's what you've got to do. You've got to sow those seeds of doubt. So true false becomes a blur. That's what a fascist, that's what you do if you want to create a fascist state. So, um, but narrative, the, you know, the narrative ethics of making sure that like stories are about power. Let's not be innocent about stories. Even the stories we tell about ourselves as storytellers are about power. And so I think it, we're all going to be accountable for the stories we tell. And we've all got to be accountable for the stories we listen to. Because audiences, audiences are in, complicit in the story. If there's no audience, there's no story. I love it. Yes, yesterday there was a press conference and I think the press secretary was saying something about fraud in the elections and even Fox news, even Fox news is it Caputo. I'm just reading this morning in the paper, Fox news said, no, no, we're not going to cover this. We're not covering this. The withdrawal of the audience to that story just like cuts it off at us at the knees. So again, I think part of our power as people is our power as audience. And if we decided, if, if 5 million people where you are decided we're no longer going to listen to that story, it's dead. It's dead. So I think that's another way we can empower ourselves to say, and it's happening here. It's happening here now. I mean, it's like the boy who cried wolf too many times. Mm -hmm. uh, the, the powers that be tried this for four years and now we're all sick of it. We don't believe it anymore. And we're, we're happy to move back into our normal lives. We're not paying any attention to it. So, I always, when I'm teaching my uh, classes in the national leadership programs, I, my saying is what you give meaning to is what you give power to. And if you decide that it's not going to have meaning for you, 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 you disempower it. You say, well, I'm not going to give it power anymore. It doesn't, I will not honor, it will not have that power over me anymore. I will not let COVID dominate my fears. I will not let the politicians, I, I, I'm not going to give it that meaning anymore. I, I'm going to I'm going to attach into another another source of meaning that's much more ennobling and dignifying and uplifting for me to get me through. Um, so, so anyway, you know me. I'm usually ranting on about lots of things. But, uh, <laughs> it's so lovely. I'm, it's it's just like being back in the old times of the golden fleas. But listen, yeah. <coughs> I'm, I had a dream the other night. And it was about, um, it was strange, it was kind of a strange dream, It'd be very clear when I woke up. And in that dream, I was 13 years old, and I have never seen a um, newspaper boy, but I was a newspaper boy. Mm -hmm. I've seen it in lots of films from the 70s and the 80s, you know, driving around in the bikes and throwing newspapers into the houses of these people. I was definitely in US and uh, I, I turned around a corner and there was these, uh, so many uh, news people. I mean, there was a whole media bus was there, there mm -hmm. and, and I couldn't go past it. I couldn't pass this group of people and they were all excited about something that was in a pink mansion. So instead I drove to the other side and there was, um, there was nobody there. There was, an, there was a black woman standing in the door smoking cigarettes and drinking coffee. And when she saw me with the newspaper, she just said, well, he's waiting for you. So I went inside and I recognized like, you know, Gone with the Wind. Uh, when you came in there, I mean, there's so, it's a big, a big mansion. Mm -hmm. and, and then I came into the house uh, and I, uh, walked into the living room and there he sat. Um, I could recognize it was Donald Trump, but he was about 102, 103 years old, sitting in a wheelchair from the 30s and looking out on the, on, on the people in, from the press. And he was quite scared. When he heard me coming in, I had some sneakers on. It was sort of, <coughs> he just looked frightened, but then he saw it was just a newspaper boy. So he took the newspaper 
unfold and 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 he was he was on the front page and he was quite angry with that and then he said i'm i'm <laughs> they're just waiting for me to die but but i'm not dead yet and can you please help me i want to get out of the house so i said well why don't you just drive the other way around and um, the kitchen door and he said well i'm more scared of that woman that i'm all these people who stand in there waiting for me and i said well give her a cigarette and so i found a north state a really old north state packet in my, and i sort of made the, the cigarette so it she could smoke it gave it to donald and said give it to her and then she, everything would be all right and then we came into the kitchen and he gave her the cigarette and she just looked at it and said north state and then she had the cigarette in silence and then she looked at him and said you don't have to be afraid of me you don't have to be afraid of anything <laughs> let's go and so the last picture of my dream was me pushing this wheelchair from the 1930 being 13 years old donald trump is 102 years he was really he was nearly there was nearly nothing left of him and this black beautiful woman walking next to us and we were walking down this little road going into town so that was that was a dream i had about a month ago something like that wow, wow. <laughs> You should have told him ahead of time. Yeah, yeah, it's true. Do we have anything to 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 add up for the whole thing to wrap up all these wonderful words that you've yeah, been? Yeah, I mean, you know, I think, I, I, you know, I, you know, maybe it's a sort of a there's some there's some religious beliefs, or maybe it's about reincarnation. But I, I, I somehow, life is the sequences of life um you know accumulative and i mean it, it, there's i guess it's a christian tradition which maybe it's also a jewish tradition but like that nothing happens without a reason or that somehow what happens to us in life now may not matter for now but it, it but it, it's nothing is lost and nothing is wasted and so i think like as as we face into a, an uncertain future i think you know part of the storytelling vocation in a way for me is like when you ask people what got you through there's a certain assumption that life prepares us for life and that um you know and that some and we all know that as we get older like you know we we might have cut up badly when we were kids and done some silly crazy things and and drove our parents to nervous breakdowns but at some point when like we're 40 or like we have a divorce or one of our kids gets sick the sequence of life has a cumulative impact around saying that it may not have been useful for then, but it's going to get useful sometime. And that the grace of life is that it keeps on giving. And that if we enter into the uncertainty of tomorrow with a, a belief, I, I, I mean that I'm going to learn something here, but I think something in my past has given me some deep understanding or I can cope with this. I can learn from this. I can, I don't necessarily need to get into the hero's journey of I'm going to get over, overcome and blah, blah, blah. No, maybe you won't. Um, you know, some people with COVID, they've had lasting impacts. So they haven't been the heroes overcoming it. And that's such an American thing in a way. It's like, no, I, I, come on. However, life, life in the, in the end, sort of, there's a grace in life, there's a deeper grace in life and that our stories somehow preserve that. And that's why it's so important that we you either you share your dreams, you share the dream, you share the story of your father-in-law, I share the story of my father. It's almost telling me, Paul or Sven, whatever tomorrow brings, there's something in your yesterday that 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 could prove to you and come in handy to say, you're gonna get through this. Uh, I, I, my, 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 uh, my adopted Palestinian son here had, had said some you know terrible trials in the last few years. And I, I wrote him a piece that he puts on his wall. And he says, you know, it, it basically says, you know, you, you're not, I don't, you don't, you're not going to get, you're not going to get over this necessarily. Um, um, and you're not going to get past it maybe necessarily. The point is to get through it. The point is just to get through it. Not, to, not, not to bring closure or to overcome it or be the hero, but just persist, get through it. 
And, I, and I, I get that brings us back to the question that I leave people to say, if anything, from our conversation today, ask your wife, ask your kids, ask your husband, ask your co-workers, uh, you know, in a, over a coffee break or over a Zoom, you know, what's got you through this? And I think you'll find some really, really amazing, amazing stories. Thank you so much, Paul, and thank you so much for taking the time here in this afternoon in Europe and this morning in, in Washington, D.C. I hope you get through it <laughs> this morning <laughs> as well, and the next and the next and the next. Hope to see you soon. All right, Sven. Thank all you very so much. much. Oh, all the best to yours. Bye.